University of Utah School of Medicine, and uh, he has really served our specialty incredibly well. He's been president of the American Otological Society. He's currently the president of the American Neurotology Society. Um, he's a director on the American Board of Otolaryngology. You guys just took your otolaryngology training examination, so you know. Actually, that's my fault. <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's, it's Dr. Shelton's fault, and so uh, we'll uh, we'll make a day of it. I mean, he's he's written uh, and published on everything in our specialty. If you look through his CV, there are articles on on just about everything. So, uh, Clef, again, thank you for for being with us and. We look forward to spending the day with you. Great. Thanks, thanks, Brad. Uh, and uh, Brad, thank you very much for the invitation for organizing things. George, thank you also. Uh, it's a real honor to be here, an honor and a privilege. Uh, before I start, though, I wanted to make sure that everybody in here knows that Paul Levine taught me how to do tympanoplasty. <laughs> That's tr it's true. It's true. Uh, 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 Paul, when I was a junior resident at Stanford, Paul was a junior faculty member. Paul just completed his head and neck fellowship at Stanford. And uh, he staffed the county hospital on Mondays. And as you know, Paul's a good sport, and he would cover anything that we, we posted. And we had a lot of chronic ear disease. And so uh, we did, it was a lot of type 1 tympanoplasties. And as you also know, Paul is very consistent and predictable. And so it was always a post Richter incision, a medial graft, and a road band drain every time. <laughs> and it, but he taught me the techniques of microsurgery. He's an you know, excellent teacher, as you know, uh, as well. It was really a great experience. But I do remind him of that every once in a while. <laughs> hey, he's and a he'll little... remind you of that as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. Uh... No, I'm okay. Um, I, lost a sh I lost a shortcut here. So I think, as you guys know, chronic ear disease is the bread and butter of, of what we do. Everything from, you know, simple tympanoplasty, moringoplasty, to complicated canal wall down reconstruction of the tegmen, reconstruction of the acicular chain. What's, what's really interesting, I think, is going to be these, these bone-conducting hearing technologies that may supplant, potentially, OCR in patients who have failed OCR and have had numerous attempts. So those, it's kind of exciting, some of the, the, the new things that are starting in, uh, in, in bone conduction technologies. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, Baja is just a transition device, and I think we're going to see better and better things come along. Um, and, uh, and I think you're right, I think we'll, we'll change uh, what we can do as long as we get the cost down. That's, that's the problem. We may have the technology, we may not be able to pay for it. So let's see. So how, how, how um, I need some, can you all see that okay? Is the angle of the screen okay? He's only been here less than 24. He's all right. Can you all see that okay? Did you hear that? <laughs> I'm from Dallas. I'm from Dallas. Sir. I still have uh, uh, a little bit of uh, that left. Uh, so anyway, I wanted to um, uh, focus on uh, a sacred chain reconstruction. I think it's something that's Im important. Uh, it, it's important if you're going to do chronic ear uh, surgery to be prepared to do a sacred chain reconstruction. Uh, it's uh, the thing that... that People in practice have probably the most difficulty with as well, uh, but just I want to go through some some techniques, uh, some of my experiences, and um, uh, hopefully give you some techniques that uh, can help you get predictable res results. And I'm sure you've heard a lot of this already from uh, uh, Brad and George, uh, but a review is always good, uh, also. So I'll give you a little that from the back. So the principles when we're to, for successful osicular chain reconstruction, we want to have a ear that's free of disease. Can you all read that back here? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, I can barely read it back here. And so uh, we also want to have a, a middle ear that's air containing. And that's important because not only is that an intact eardrum, but it's also a middle ear that's not full of mucosal disease and fibrosis and things like that. And that's where staging may come into play. Uh, uh, to do that. Um, and then we need some type of connection between the eardrum and the inner ear 
to conduct the sound. And the key is to have a connection that's stable uh, and secure over the long term. And it, sound, it sounds like uh, fairly um, basic things. And then for Collier-Miller prostheses, I think it's important to use cartilage. Uh, over my career, I've seen new materials come out, and, and classically they always say, oh, this is biocompatible, you don't need to have cartilage. And they say it with plastopore even. Plastopore, uh, lately titanium also uh, came out with the uh, unity cartilage. And we find that you do. And I think cartilage has some other advantages, and I'll talk about that uh, in a minute. Um, so, the hard part about osicular chain reconstruction is how tight to make your prosthesis. Because uh, you want it tight enough to stay in place, but not so tight that it extrudes. Uh, and uh, so, uh, there's been some research that would, would predict that actually the, the um, a loose, secure fit is the best tight, so, uh, best best tightness. So not something that's overly tight, but enough, but but uh, uh, tight enough that it'll stay in place. And this is a study uh, that um, this could be hard to see. Uh, looking at frequency along the bottom and displacement, uh, foot plate displacement along this axis. Uh, the red is normal, and as you go down the line. Uh, uh, things get worse. And the, the legend is uh, yellow is loose, um, green is medium, and, and blue is tight. And you can see that if you make your connection too tight, you lose your low frequencies. Uh, it, in the very high frequencies, there's a little bit of gain from being tight, but it's very, very small. But you do, you do lose your low frequencies if it's too tight um, uh, there. And so... Um, <coughs> Using this data, we'd say that we want to have something that's uh, uh, less tension to give us better low frequencies. And usually in our sicker chain reconstruction, that's where we do have our problem as well. Uh, more tension I might give you a little bit of high frequencies, but it looks very, very small. So the, the, the principle then is uh, the, the tension to hold it in place, uh, but not so much that it extrudes. <coughs> Uh, and, and our goal is to have a secure connection that's long-term, uh, has long-term stability. And if you look at, at some of the literature, you know, you want to look at your, your results that are at two years, five years, not, not the six-month result <coughs> as well. So, uh, as I mentioned over the years, there's, there's been plenty of materials that have come up uh, for use of osicular chain reconstruction. I trained uh, on homograft ossicles. And so at, in the early 80s, you could buy from a company a cadaver ossicle that had been carved into a strut that came in different sizes, that came in a bottle of formaldehyde. You took your measurement and decided how long you wanted it. Then you took a drill and, and uh, uh, adjusted the length, whatever you needed. Uh, and of course, that became a popular uh, uh, after AIDS came around. And we really have stopped stopped using homographs so much, but autographs are still uh, useful uh, as well. Um, Plastopore has been around since the 70s. Uh, bioglass was very popular uh, at one point. You probably even never heard of bioglass. It was the new darling of the, the osicular reconstruction material. And then the long-term results showed that it resorbed in the ear and didn't have that stable uh, results. Uh, hydroxyapatite uh, is become very popular, and then the most recent is titanium. I'll talk a little about titanium, titanium too. Uh, so this just shows an Inca center position. So this is a right ear. Uh, this is the this is the malleus, and and uh, then the body of the Incas, and the Incas has been taken out. A hole has been placed in the head of the Incas, and it's sitting on the capitulum. Uh, Inca center's position is still a good technique. I use it very rarely because, for me, the, looking at the time it takes in the operating room for me to take a drill and craft a, uh, an ossicle, uh, it's a lot cheaper to take something out of a box uh, and to put it in there. The other, other ways you can use an Incas, this shows some other illustrations uh, showing the Incas. This is the, the, the malleus, the Incas bodies uh, between the malleus and the stapes. Here's a uh, ink is going down to the to the foot plate under the malleus as well. 
If I'm going to use an incus, I'll usually use it like this. I'll carve a strut between the malleus and the stapes. And where I typically use this, it's not very often, is in a case where I, I need to reconstruct the um, osseous chain, but I don't want to raise the eardrum. And so that would be uh, if I'm doing a, a facial nerve decompression, like a middle fossa facial nerve decompression for trauma, and the incus has been dislocated, or if it's a facial nerve tumor where I've had to take the incus out to get the tumor out, I want to reconstruct it. If I'm worried about a CSF leak, I don't want to raise the drop. And I can put an incus in through a facial recess and reconstruct the, the ossicker chain. Uh, and so you can see here you've got the strut going from the, the, the malleus to the stapes. And what's important here is that the drum has got to be stable because the, when you put this reconstruction in, it tends to push the malleus forward. So it doesn't work so well if you're also grafting the drum. The drum's not stable. It'll pu push your malleus forward and you'll lose your tension. Also, the relationship between the malleus and the um, stapes is important. You want the uh, uh, malleus where it's more straight over the, the uh, stapes. Rather, if you have a malleus that's too far forward, your force vector is not so good to the stapes and it just won't be as efficient. Uh, for, for sound transfer. If you need to go back, that, that Inca strut is a bony union, isn't it? I mean, you, you can't disarticulate that. So if you've got cholesteatoma or something like that, I, there was one patient in particular that I remember, she had an Inca in her position, she had a, uh, not a great hearing result, I went in, and, and Bill Luxor even said, you know, this is often a, a bony union there between the Incus and the capitulum of the stapes. You can't get it off. I could not get that thing off. What did you end up doing? Um, a Baja. At another date, but another time. Um, so anyway, so this is pla plastopore, you know, Calumel or prostheses, plastopore, tops and pops. Uh, it's been around uh, forever. We'll, we'll talk about that later. And this just shows a Calumel or prosthesis in place where we've got the the drum, the cartilage, the prosthesis under the foot plate. And that, that's what we're talking about. Um, I, I'm a big fan of cartilage. And the, the reason, reason why I am is for a, a number of reasons. I think it's important here to prevent extrusion. Uh, even in the, the uh, few times that, that uh, I've used hydroxyapatite in the past, I always put cartilage in there as well. Um, it, it gives you a... a uh, a broad connection with the eardrum. It gives stability to your, your ossicular prosthesis. Uh, with plastopore, the plastopore sticks to the cartilage pretty well, pretty nicely. And then also in chronic ear disease with eustachian tube dysfunction, it helps support that posterior superior quadrant where you get retractions as well. Um, taking a cartilage graft really doesn't uh, lead to any kind of cosmetic deformity. The only complaints I've had is I've had some people recently say they can't keep their earbuds in for their iPod as well if you take the tragus. In fact, I had one guy that I had to go back and put a little bit of cartilage from his concha back into his tragus so he could do that. So let's go through um, um, just the steps of a, 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 a sacred chain reconstruction. Let's see how it looks from the back here. Uh, and so this is going to be a uh, right ear. The eardrum's intact. We're going to raise the tympanum made of flap. Uh, you can see the, the, uh, the, the drawing is not so great here. So let me show you what, what we're really talking about. This is my cartoon of the, the same thing. So the inner circle is the eardrum. The black line is the malleus. This is the ear canal. And so the flap we want to make, we want to make the flap the length about five or six millimeters from the annulus. The edges don't come quite to the annulus on a second stage. It tends to shrink up a little bit uh, there. Um, and then we'll raise the drum, fill the uh, middle ear with uh, gel foam, as you can see there. You can see the stapes uh, right here. Come on in, how y'all? Um, and uh, then we're going to take some cartilage uh, from the tragus, and the key is to um, uh, make the incision on the back side of the, the uh, tragus so it's invisible. Uh, uh, if you don't want to put it on the front, I had a resident do that once in the, on a kid, and the family came back in and asked me if the knife had slipped. And so you want to make it so it's invisible, and it's pretty easy to do that. Um, and so, so I hope this video is going to, people are going to be able to see this video, okay? Um, oh, what was running, yeah.
Okay, so this is a uh, tragal cartilage uh, on a uh, <clears throat> sponge. Oh, no. um, <coughs> there we go. On a, on a sponge that won't slip around. There's a on the perichondrium. There's a thick side and a thin side. The uh, thick side is looser than the thin side, so the thick side is where we start the elevation, just like uh, septoplasty, come right off. And then flip it over to the thin side, which is more adherent, and then it'll just pull right off. Is that a freer? It's a freer, yeah. And then we'll put the, both pieces on Teflon blocks. Sometimes the perichondria is useful as well. Uh, with the cartilage, we want a 5x5 five five millimeter platform. Uh, we want to create it to slightly concave in shape. With the malleus present, you want it a little bit thinner. So the great thing about a 11 blade, the widest part is 5 millimeters. And so there's your measuring device. We'll just um, I trim up the, the, the sides to, to make it a 5-millimeter uh, uh, square, then bevel the edges. If the malleus is present, generally 5 millimeters is going to be too wide in that dimension, and so usually you'll make it a little bit narrower uh, in that dimension to have it, have it fit. You do this under the scope? I do. Uh, Brad, these days I do everything. <laughs> <laughs> and so then here's a plastic pour uh, top, a wet prosthesis on a wet tongue blade will stick. So it's really easy. You can hand it back and forth to your nurse. It won't fall on the floor. It doesn't work for titanium or for hydroxyapatite, but it's a nice way to manage it. Uh, and then uh, we use a lemon blade, uh, the, the platform hanging over the edge of the tongue blade to trim it off. <clears throat> and usually with uh, normal anatomy, meaning a canal wall up, uh, either a top or a pop, I usually start off by cutting about two millimeters off the, the length of the prosthesis and then go from there. And then we'll uh, put the, this is the middle ear spill geo foam, we'll put the prosthesis in the middle ear. A wet plastipore prosthesis. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, she likes that plastic. Yeah. A wet, wet plastic pour prosthesis, you can pick it up with a, with a three suction, with a three barren suction on the platform and maneuver it into place very easily uh, with a rosin. And then, so, so this, is, this is one of the most important slides I'm going to show you during this talk today. And that's to make your prosthesis length the proper length. It should just touch the undersurface of the eardrum, as you, you see on that side on that insert. It's not going to show. Uh, there. Uh, the, the prosthesis length should be uh, cut so when the eardrum is in the natural position, it will just touch the undersurface of the drum. Then the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to slide in our uh, cartilage. We'll pull the prosthesis back a little bit, slide the cartilage in between the eardrum and the prosthesis, which writes the prosthesis. Uh, you can see it right, uh, going in right there. And then the, uh, the, this, the second way that we want uh, to lock, I didn't sh uh, stop enough, the edge of the cartilage will, will fit just underneath the edge of the sputum. That's another way to tell that your prosthesis length is right. Then the third way to tell your prosthesis length is right is when you lay the eardrum back, it'll be tended slightly by your, um, uh, by your cartilage as you can see depicted here. And so the secret of Collier Miller uh, reconstruction is the tension that you need to keep the assembly stable is provided by the thickness of your cartilage. The prosthesis itself just is barely touching the eardrum, and so what you add is the thickness of the, the uh, cartilage to give you the tension to hold things uh, stable. Okay, so let's see if this will run. <coughs> So it's a right ear, it's a second stage. We're going to elevate the eardrum. Put 
put some gel foam in the middle ear. My nurse will bring in the gel foam, I'll grab it with my suction, put it in the uh, middle ear, take my finger off the hole, and place the gel foam in the right position. You can see the, the stapes is there. Uh, in a, a pop, there's a hole down the center of it. We just usually mount it on <coughs> the needle, uh, put it down uh, in, in there with the rosin. Uh, the, uh, the wet prosthesis will kind of stick to rosin, so it's pretty easy to handle. And then uh, place it in a position you can see the stapes, um, sepetal tendon underneath that. We'll lay the drum back, make sure the length is right. And usually, cutting two millimeters off the prosthesis is a, is a pretty accurate measurement. Um, and then we'll, we'll put some more, more gel foam around it. Prosthesis back slightly, and then we'll put in our cartilage. And uh, it's, a, it's a fairly big piece of cartilage, actually. And the edge is uh, tucked underneath the uh, scutal edge there. Any tips on how to knock, knock your prosthesis over when you place that cartilage? Yeah, that can be, be uh, uh, difficult. Uh, and then just you can see that the cartilage uh, is tending the drum slightly. Um, you know, George, I, I will uh, I'll pull the, the prosthesis toward me, and then when I push the, pros the cartilage in between the drum, it'll, it'll actually will write the prosthesis many times. It doesn't always work, but, but that's one thing that uh, can be helpful. Do you always remove the perichondrium? I always do. Yeah. And then, have you ever? Do you ever try to thin the cartilage? Yes, yeah, sometimes. Uh, you you can uh, with a lumb blade, you can slice it down and, and thin thin it out, uh, especially a thick piece, um, to to make it thinner and more concave. Also. So this is uh, from an old paper where we looked at a number of uh, OCRs, and you can see. On this axis is the percentage. We've got closure within 10, 20, or 30 dBs of the air bone gap. The torps are in red, the porps are in yellow. Typically, we'll use closure within 20 as success. And you can see that in this series, we could get closure with uh, porps better than torps, as you might imagine, more stable situation. And the uh, closure with the uh, porps was in the 70s, and with the, with the uh, torps was in the 60s. Uh, what was interesting is we also looked uh, at our results by procedure. Uh, and again, the percentage along this axis, closure along this axis here, we've got patients that had a uh, temp with canal wall down, a temp with canal wall up, and then just a tympanoplasty only. And you can see that the worst results were the canal wall downs. And typically, uh, in this situation, canal wall downs are going to be revision cases, cases with very severe disease. Temps, on the other hand, are going to be the cases that have le less severe disease, and of course, they, so they did the best. Also, uh, many say that with a canal wall down, you've got a narrower middle ear space, and that also leads to poor hearing results, and that's certainly my experience as well. Jim Sheehy said that that was not accurate. Have you ever? We, was Jim still practicing a year? Yeah. But I, in my case, my my, my uh, poorest results are with canal wall downs. And then this is an interesting slide. It's, it's kind of, I would say, dirty data, but it's uh, long-term follow-up here. Uh, and uh, follow-up, uh, all cases, yellow is 24 months, blue is 42 months, white is 60 months. And if you look at the 20 dB closure, it's fairly stable. The problem is uh, we had attrition in this follow-up group, and so the cases with a five-year follow-up are a lot fewer than those that are in the 24-month follow-up. But so I don't think they, I don't think the results got better, but I think the results are actually pretty stable. And we just got through looking at our results at Utah that one of my junior faculty is going to present, and uh, we have a minimum of two-year follow-up, uh, average of five-year follow-up, and we also see fairly 
very stable results as well. Uh, extrusion of the prosthesis is about 5%. It usually doesn't happen until almost two years, and so that's why the long-term follow-up is important. In most of the cases, it's, it's not a biocompatibility problem. It's a eustachian tube problem. The drum gets sucked down around the prosthesis and extrudes. So uh, hydroxyapatite is uh, biocompatible. You can put it directly against the drum, uh, and it, it, it tolerates it well. Uh, you can see the mucosa growing on this prosthesis as well. But this close-up shows the uh, prosthesis against the drum. It looks, appears to be tolerated it uh, quite well. Uh, there's also other designs of hydroxyapatite prostheses. This is the, the uh, Weir's prosthesis that use, utilizes the malleus uh, and goes from the malleus to the foot plate or the capitulum. Uh, we did a study looking at a slightly different prosthesis. It was made out of material from Ionis. It, it's like HA, though. It's biocompatible. It's um, a solid prosthesis. You need to adjust it with the drill. Um, and uh, we, we compared uh, a series with um, plastopore. So on this, the percentage along this axis, uh, we've got pops and tops. The yellow is plastopore. The green is the ionis. Uh, it is closure within 20 dB. And you can see the results are fairly, fairly equivalent uh, there. So the newest uh, darling of ossicular chain reconstruction material is titanium. Uh, titanium is nice because it's uh, lightweight, it's stiff, uh, it uh, has uh, low mass. This is uh, from a company called Kurtz, and this is their adjustable prosthesis where the platform can be adjusted uh, on the shaft, uh, a top and a pop. And so I'm going to go through the um, adjustment the sizing regimen on this. What, do I use titanium? No. I haven't yet. I haven't. What brand do you use? Um, Grace. 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 Which is which is probably easier than what I'm going to show you. This is one of the, this is one of the first manufacturers of titanium. But anyway, so it's uh, um, it's a right ear. Put a little packing in there. Uh, we've got a we've got a sizer, a metal sizer that goes in. Uh, to determine the length of the prosthesis. So it's pretty straightforward in that regard. Make, check, check the, uh, uh, make, lay the drum down, make sure the prosthesis is not pushing up on the drum. So make sure the, the size is right. And then, so this is the, the uh, prosthesis. It's a pop um, with the uh, platform. You, you use a sizing jig, so you figure out what size you need. Uh, my nurse is going to put a little bit of water on the, the jig to make the prosthesis kind of uh, stick to it. And we'll, we'll put the prosthesis in the proper jig. I can barely see that right here. Um, and then uh, the platform's I put down a little space and then it's crimped and that holds the uh, platform in that, that position and then the excess shaft is cut off with a love blade. There. But um, the nice thing with these prostheses, so the uh, platform is not solid. You can see through it. You can. Um, it helps you when you place it. I'm going to show you a top uh, in the next video. You can see how, how uh, thin the shaft is. If you have a have a narrow um, oval window, would be helpful. So this is a, a different case. This is a canal wall down now. A left canal wall down. We're going to put a prosthesis in, um, and uh, there, there's the sizing device. First of all, we're going to put it on the foot plate to, to check. There's the, the drum. Check the uh, height of the drum. And there's our prosthesis. You can see how thin that shaft is. Uh, it, uh, 
it will go into a narrow <coughs> window pretty easily. <coughs> And uh, looks like the right, right height. And so in this case, uh, we'll put some uh, cartilage over it, just like with the uh, plastic for prosthesis I showed you earlier. And then we'll put some fascia in to reconstruct the rest of the drum. You typically put the fascia in after you've placed your prosthesis? Uh, in a case like this, I do. If I'm doing a, uh, like a type, uh, if I'm doing a canal wall up and I'm doing a tympanoplasty, and then I'm going to put in a prosthesis also, I'll put the fascia in first in that case and then, then lift it up. Uh, you know, I've kind of gone back and forth and done it both ways, but I think for me it's probably easier to put the fascia in first. That way I can look at my prosthesis height and make sure it looks good too. So we looked at our titanium results. So um, look at my slide. So we had uh, 137 cases, uh, 84 were plastic, 4, 53 was a titanium. And uh, so on this slide, again, the percentages along this axis, we're looking at closure within 20 dB. The plastic pore is yellow, the titanium is green. And you can see that the uh, plastic pore beat the titanium in both cases. It was significant for the tops, it was not significant <coughs> for the pops there. And so I was, I was disappointed by these results, uh, quite frankly. Um, and. I'm not sure exactly why. One thing I've noticed with this manufacturer is they, they, they have very pure titanium. They tout how pure it is. And, and if you ever revise a case, there's no fibrous envelope around the prosthesis, um, that, which I think helps give it some stability. I've had a couple of cases where I can see the prosthesis um, uh, has moved out from underneath the cartilage. I mean, here's a cartilage. I've got an edge of prosthesis that I can see on the side of the cartilage. I've never had that with, with plastic pork. And so I think that there just may not be much reaction with the materials the manufacturer uses, and just may not be quite as stable as what we get with plastic pork. So are you back to using plastic pork? I'm back to using plastic pork. Mm -hmm. So um, a common uh, problem that we, I just want to finish up with some, some uh, pro problems and issues that we might face. The, a common problem is, um, and, and I actually, just to elaborate on what you said, Brad, first. I, I'm back to Plastipore because the results seem about the same, and it's easier for me to handle, to adjust the length and things like that. I can just use an 11 blade uh, for it. Um, so this is uh, hard to see, but it's an eroded incus. There's, um, the capitulum is here, and the incus is there, and there's no connection. And, and there's about a millimeter gap. And so what do you do in this situation? And there's tons of things that have come, been come up for this. There's an apple bomb prosthesis you can put in between there. You can put a bone chip in there. Uh, you can do all kinds of things. Well, with the, the new HA cements, it's been interesting to, to use them for reconstruction. And here's the, uh, the, again, the situation on the left with the incus, and then this is a reconstructed IS joint with the cement, with the, and we use Oda, Oda mimics. The trick is to make sure that the, all the mucosa is denuded from the inca so it can stick, because it won't stick to um, uh, the bone. And you can use a, a diamond micro drill, you can use a laser and things like that. When this works, it, you hit a home run. When it doesn't work, you're back to where you started from. Uh, and so I had a partner that did a lot of these and was, was enthusiastic about it a while. Nowadays, if I'm in the situation, I usually will just take the incus out and put it in a pop also. I do use the cement for revision stapes cases where the incus is eroded. And I've got to put a wire on that short incus. And the otomimics, I think, does help quite a bit in that situation. Stable long term? Uh, so, so far, so far it has been. Um, I mean, I've been doing it for maybe three or four years, and it, it's for stapes, and it seems like it's been pretty good. Um, you know, stapes and a, and a 
nitinol wire, ten, uh, with the nitinol wire and the photomimic sensory free stable. Um, so um, let's talk about a couple more uh, situations. Uh, what about a chronic ear with a fixed stapy? Now that's, um, uh, that's, that, that's a problem. So here we've got our, our chronic ear here. There's a, a perforation. There's all this tympanic sclerosis around the stapes. Here you can see the side view of the oval window. There's a lot of, of tympanic sclerosis fixing the stapes as well. So, uh, so first of all, with a, per, with a perforated ear and a fixed stapes, we, we don't want to do a stapedectomy in that case. We want to make sure that we close the perforation and then come back at the second stage when the ear is sterile and then do a stapedectomy if necessary. What you can do, though, is if, in a case like this, is if um, you know you're going to be, if, if I know I'm going to be dealing with it, I'll uh, schedule the case with a laser. And I'll take the laser um, and remove the superstructure, char the tympanic sclerosis, pick it away. And so sometimes you can get a mobile foot plate and not open up the old window and be able to put a prosthesis in. I think that that's always worth trying. It's always a judgment call about how aggressive you are with that stapes uh, with the perforation. And certainly the most conservative way to manage that is to close the perforation first and then come back to the stapes uh, later. Uh, if you can't mobilize the stapes, then typically we'll do, at the second stage, we'll do a, just a, a, a stapedectomy. We'll do a full uh, foot plate extraction, take a piece of perichondrium, use the, the thin side of the perichondrium with the cartilage side down and cover the oval window and then put a prosthesis on top of it, uh, as you see here, uh, between the drum. The two, the, two, the two tricks for that is, one, determine your prosthesis length before you take the foot plate out, okay? Uh, because you don't really have a good way to judge it otherwise. And then two, once you put your perichondrium over the oval window, it's really hard to tell what the margins are of the oval window and where the prosthesis is going to go. And so you'd like to take your microscope, kind of and do, fix it in one position and use some adjacent landmarks to help you determine where your prosthesis is going to go uh, as well. So you measure before you take out the foot plate, cut your prosthesis to right. the appropriate length, yeah. then take out your foot plate. Exactly, exactly right. And, and once you have your foot plate out, you want to be able to <laughs> rapidly get the oval window covered and you want to have all your parts ready to go before you do that as well. As it turns out, when you do a full foot plate extraction, your prosthesis length becomes less important because the period length is going to seek the perichondrium that you put in there. Uh, and so it, 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 you have a little bit more leeway. So the, the thing that gives me the uh, most problem with my own cases when I revise them is scutal erosion and uh, lateralization of the drum because of scutal erosion. So here you see the situation. Here's a normal um, ear with perforation. This is my cartoon with the ear canal. The green is the eardrum. The red is the middle ear. The yellow arrow shows the middle ear height in that situation. With scutal erosion, the, uh, and this is, this is my, my scutal erosion here, uh, the, the eardrum seeks the edge of that bone. And so if the sputum is eroded, it's going to be more lateral in that area, and your middle ear depth is going to be greater. And so if, you, if you're putting a prosthesis in a situation like this, and you put in an average size prosthesis, it's going to end up being too short. If um, the, the, ero if the middle ear height is very deep, and you've got to put in a longer prosthesis, I don't know why, but it tends to uh, end up with um, sometimes an unstable situation. So I think, it, first of all, with, with a scutal erosion, it's important to realize what you're dealing with, making that prosthesis length a little bit longer. Uh, sometimes in cases, I'll need to revise them, and I'll go in and reconstruct the sputum with bone pate. And, you, and to do that, unfortunately, it's a two-stage procedure. We'll uh, put a piece of psoriasis in the middle ear, put bone pate to, to reconstruct the sputum, uh, put the drum back down in the right position, and then come back six months later and do the ossicular reconstruction. And the bone pate works really well. You go back in the second time, it looks, it's just like regular bone. You can drill it. It's, uh, it's very good. And we just get that from the, the mastoid cortex. Uh, the other problem that comes up sometimes is the so-called McDonald arches of the stapes. And so instead of the, the capitulum is absent there, and so you've got the, just rounded arches, and there's nothing to hold a pop on and you can cut a pop with, with um, uh, slots in it so it'll fit on the, 
the arches, but it's just not as, as stable as if you had a capitulum. So one, one solution is, uh, if you have enough room, put in a top and just put it in between the arches to under the footplate, and that, that works uh, uh, well. What it doesn't allow you to do, if you have your arches and you have your prosthesis in, you can't adjust your prosthesis to be, be a, a good angle with the eardrum. It does prevent you with that. And so sometimes it's better just to go on, uh, again, if you have a laser, remove your arches with the laser, and then you can put a prosthesis directly down to the footplate, and that, that, that works uh, also. So, so uh, in conclusion, there's a lot of different ways to do ossicular reconstruction, and there's certainly not any right way. I mean, the old saying is, you know, there's a whole lot of prosthesis to do something, then none of them must work very well. And it's pro probably probably true. They don't work as well as we wish they did, I think. But I, but I think that with these techniques, you can get stable results. But figure out what works best for you and stick with that technique and try to master it. Because if you're in practice and you're operating at different hospitals and they all have different prostheses in stock, you could be using a different prosthesis every time you do a case. And that's really not a good situation. You'd like to be comfortable with one prosthesis and get that technique down, and that way you get reliable results. Thank you very much. This is our, we have, we have an annual meeting in June. This is uh, my slide for that. We're having uh, David Isley, uh, Paul Flint, and uh, Rob Jack for our speakers. Paul Levine has been our speaker a few years ago uh, as well. So, do uh, you might have any questions? When you put your your, your pork down, do you do you notch the pork, or do you just leave it as a as a cylinder and onto the capitulum? I, I cut a little slit in the side of it as I put it down, just to let it expand if the capitulum is big. I try to I try to make it look like it's saw horses over the stapedial tendon, you know, because you've, uh, you've got a little slit. And, and, and the lungs <coughs> taught me that that trick. And would you say that you do more medial grafts or lateral surface grafts? I do more. I, I do almost exclusively lateral grafts. Do you? Yeah. And teaching the residents lateral surface technique. Uh, you you know it, uh, it it's hard. The problem with the lateral graft, uh, the, the uh, lateral graft is very reliable, uh, but it requires a lot more surgery and. If you screw it up, it really you really screw it up because you because you take take out the whole drum remnant, and so you could end up with a bigger perforation. You're also in the technique you're drilling close to the ossicles, you're drilling close to the malleus, and so it requires attention to detail to do it well. Uh, but um, it is uh, it, it's a bulletproof technique. I mean, it really does work about 90% of the time. Uh, and I get a lot of referrals. Uh, you know, I'm sure you all do too. You know the filt and pound plastic. Once you go up to the yeah. university, they use a different technique there, and that that that, that helps. Yeah, I I was doing almost all lateral surface in when I was in private practice, and then it just, I just found it easier to teach medial surface <coughs> technique, you know, graphing technique, and found the results fairly comparable. Although I will still have kind of a low threshold if it's a very large perforation, if it's an anterior perforation, if it's a got a large anterior canal wall overhang. Um, but but definitely, you know, teaching that technique and and, and it takes takes longer and the the the, um, the, the minor complication rate, you know, blunting and, yep. and that kind of thing is, is, is higher. What do you do about uh, if you have a facial nerve that prolapses? It's a no staping superstructure, and the patient knows partially prolapsed over the oval window over the foot plate. You still put a prosthesis down. Yeah, so, so with an overhanging facial, I think one of the most important things intraoperatively is to realize what you're dealing with. Realize that that's not just some scar tissue there that you can scrape out with a rosin needle. And, uh, and so that's, that's number one. Uh, but you know, generally, you can gently manipulate a facial nerve and get a prosthesis uh, in there under the foot plate uh, if you have, have room, and it tends to work out pretty well. Um, and I, I think uh, in a case like this, if you're in practice and you're an occasional otologic surgeon, there's no harm with sending that to somebody that's more experienced. Uh, and just back, backing out if the facial nerve is significantly covering the old one, though. But with, with uh, caution, you can generally get a prosthesis in there. 
And any tips for getting your torque to stay on the foot plate? Do you use a shoe? Do you? Yeah. So, so that, so the, 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 I think that's a good question, Brad. The, you know, the, the getting a, uh, the stability of the torque reconstruction is still a, still a problem. There's just less normal anatomy you're working with. I usually will take a rose needle and <clears throat> scrape the mucosa off the foot plate. That'll allow the, the prosthesis to adhere to, to adhere to it a little bit. I've seen the shoes. I've never tried them. How, have, do you use them? No. Yeah. No. George, do you use them? No. Sometimes I find when, you, when you're going back to the second stage, there's some mucosal bands that you can use kind of to, to, to stabilize the, the torque. Um, you can you know slide it between two little mucosal bands and make a little perforation in the mucosal bands. You have to make sure you're you know they are bands and not the foot plate itself. But uh, if you can make a, a little perforation in those bands, that will help kind of stabilize your uh, your torque. But that's doesn't happen often. But uh, I've seen it a, a few times. Any other questions? All right. Let's take a break.